Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered. Stormed out with shot and shell, while horse and hero fell. They that fought so well, came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell, all that was left of them, left of the six hundred. Welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I'm Tina. So this is my 2021 March wrap-up for book reviews. March was as exciting as it could be, I guess, for me. Just last week, on the 31st, I finished writing my sci-fi trilogy, Space Opera. So I'm very excited about that. I'm going to take a week before jumping into editing book one. Usually I wait a few months to edit, but given, you know, it's a while since I edited book one because, you know, uh, I had to write the other two, and I've only edited it, I think, a couple times, so I'm going to jump right back in. Besides, I've got the other part three fresh in my head, so that's great for, you know, continuity and things like that. Uh, I picked up two books this month to read, someday, eventually. I picked up The Ragged Astronauts by Bob Shaw, and a bookmark, apparently. So many books, so little time. Uh, yeah, true. I think everyone can attest to this. I picked this up because I have this rather awesome looking sequel to this called The Wooden Spaceships. And uh, I was like, well, I have to read the first one. I, I actually was kind of hoping that the first cover would look like this too. I'm pretty sure I ordered the first cover that looked like this, but they sent me this one. That's what I get for ordering for like $2 off Amazon and I'm paying like $6 shipping. So <laughs> and then I also got Kokoro by uh, Natsume Soseki. Apologies if I can't pronounce that properly. Uh, I saw another booktuber do a review of this and I've heard about it in other places as well so I was like, yeah, why not? I had a, I had a gift card. I decided to use it wisely. Okay, so uh, I read seven books in March. How I did this I have no idea. <laughs> I'm like, what? I read seven? I'm gonna jump right into them. Um, I don't have reviews for all of them because I reviewed some of them in separate single reviews, so I'm not gonna, I'll mention those, but I'm not gonna go through them in detail. So the first book that I read was called Naked Truth or Equality, The Forbidden Fruit by Carrie Hayes. So this is an indie book. I got this from Whispering Stories, where I'm a guest reviewer. Uh, so it's a historical fiction and it was published last year. It's the fictionalized true story of two women attempting to push against and through the rampant sexism of post-Civil War United States. Big task, <laughs> ladies, big task. So in the late 1800s in New York, two sisters, they tried to run for office. <laughs> I guess, I, I don't know why that sounds so strange, but uh, given the American history of women in politics, uh, this is quite a, uh, quite a feat on their part. Leading up to this moment though, the story is a tale involving seduction and blackmail and bigotry. So the characters are Tennessee Claflin and Victoria Woodhall. These are the sisters and they slowly become involved in politics and then they're actually end up being brought to trial by their own family for obscenity. I'd never heard of this story before, but then again, I'm Canadian and uh, I don't, I took an American history class in like high school. And uh, other than that, aside from like basically contextualized history from like American literature class, I don't have as broad a knowledge of it as I'm assuming Americans do. So, <laughs> what should have been a riveting kind of story is actually rather bogged down by the way the story is told. I spent a great deal of the first, you know, half of the novel confused. <laughs> These characters and historical figures kind of inter are introduced into the story, but without any backstory. So, there's a list of characters that start, that are like, Ulysses S. Grant is, I don't know, I can't even remember who he is, some kind of president or something. Um, so, given that, you know, we're given the bare, bare amount of information, so I don't know, as I said, I'm not American, and so I know the basics, but I only have the vaguest idea of who that guy is. You know, I only know who Frederick Douglass and Harriet Beecher Stowe are because of that American literature class I took <laughs> in university. Tied to this, all the other characters that aren't historical figures, I'm assuming there are some fictionalized characters, um, are given no explanation or backstory either, so it felt like I was expected to know who these people were already, which was kind of frustrating. Likewise, so many things happened in the story that I didn't feel like I got to know Tennessee and Victoria that well. Uh, like, their motivation I wasn't really sure about, and I wasn't as emotionally invested as I could have been. Yet, I will say, it's an impeccably researched novel. There's little details about life at the time period, you know, it feels very authentic. One of the best aspects of the novel is the inclusion of primary sources, like newspaper articles for, that are actually real primary sources. <laughs> like, they're not fake, they're, they're real, which is really, really cool. You know, sometimes, you know, you get a novel that you think is going to be right up your alley, and it just doesn't sit with you for some reason. And I think that's what happened to me here. I'm giving it a three to five stars, but 
I think that readers who really love that period of American history or even just American people that know more about it are would like love this novel. It, it is really, I'd say it's still really good, it just didn't work for me. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> so you can check that out if you're interested. The next book I read was The Galaxy and the Ground Within by Becky Chambers. I loved this. <laughs> you can check out my standalone review if you wish. I've included the link below. Yeah, th that was great. <laughs> Sargasso of Space I read next by Andre Norton, which is from the 50s. It's a classic science fiction. I also did a deep dive into this book in another video, and I've included the link to that as well. The next book I read after that was... Um, Trail of Lightning. I keep I keep calling it Trial of Lightning, so sorry if I say that. Trail of Lightning by Rebecca Roanhorse. It's from 2018. It's post-apocalyptic fiction. I got this book from the library, Library for the Win. My sister received a copy for Christmas, actually, which surprised me because it did not seem like the kind of book she would read. Like, she usually reads really depressing memoirs about, like, child soldiers or feminist nonfiction. <laughs> so I was like, why are you reading this? Uh, but anyway, my sister lives in Toronto and I won't be seeing her for a while, even though I did actually see her on the weekend for Easter. Uh, but at the time, I didn't think I'd be seeing her for a while. So I rented it from the library. Long story, freaking short. Oh my god. I usually try to give my reviews some kind of semblance of professionalism, but all I can say about this book is O-M-F-G. <laughs> So good! I read this book well into the night twice because I couldn't put it down. I honestly have no critiques of this novel at all. The beginning is very strong and harrowing. It sets the tone to let you know what to expect, which is great. In terms of characters, I love a tortured heroine and Maggie's backstory. It was tragic and disturbing enough to make her demeanor and misanthropy understandable. I loved her strength and I also loved her vulnerability. I think Roanhurst did a great job in giving us a well-rounded character. Kai wasn't as flushed out as she was, but I think it worked with the story. I think that if he, we'd gotten a bit more backstory about him, it would have kind of ruined some of her learning about him. And it was also a first person story, so obviously you're not going to get the depth of character for the other characters that you do the first char first person, especially if the writer doesn't want you to. <laughs> I love how he was like the healer of the pair as historically in fiction. Um, that would have been the woman's job while the guy was the monster slayer. So he was both great as a contrast to her in abilities and demeanor, and a compliment to her as well. He seemed like a genuine nice guy as well, and I enjoyed their sexual tension. I thought that was really well done. The side characters were awesome. Uh, Cliff and Rissa were a fun addition. Coyote was fantastic. He was kind of just as I pictured he would be based on some some courses I took on Indigenous Literature in University, and so I really, really liked his depiction. And the other guy, I'm not even going to try to pronounce his name, <laughs> I'm going to call him the other guy. <laughs> Lightning Man. Uh, he was intriguing in how he takes up so much of Maggie's story, and it's not, but it's not present for most of it. The setting of this novel is utterly amazing and such a refreshing take on the genre. I thoroughly enjoy that we didn't really get along with an ex exposition into what the big water is and we're left to infer that on our own. I loved how the story takes place uh, kind of on, you know, indigenous land and is based on native cultures. It was such a vast and different, you know, history from the European and British myths that I grew up with. So it was really good though that I had this background of the myths from the course I took in university because we, even though we studied Canadian First Nations, which is not the same as American, you know, First Nations, I'm mixing up the terms of First Nation and Native and Indigenous because I know people have different preferences. So this is my potentially misguided attempt to be inclusive. I apologize if this is offensive. I don't know. I'm trying not to be. <laughs> I love the monsters in this book though. I will say that. Okay. I want to talk a little bit more about the Indigenous setting. I love this aspect so much, especially how she didn't feel it was necessary to include, you know, include white people at all. There aren't enough mainstream stories about people of Indigenous background, I think, from the United States. I also think this novel can show people who aren't aware of, of Indigenous groups, like how they function, um, how they have different tribes and classes and their own stereotypes, just like in every culture. Uh, now, I'm not expert on this, and I don't intend to speak for cultures that mi not mine own at all. That is not my intention here. I took a Canadian Indigenous Literature course in university where we focused on some of these issues as well as some of the common shared myths among North American Indigenous groups. It, it really makes me angry and ashamed that my country has treated its Indigenous people so terribly and, you know, the legacy of cultural genocide and residential schools has left such a scar on on the people and on the country and you know as Ron Horst says in the novel I had forgotten that we had already suffered our apocalypse over a century before and I thought for a book that doesn't 
delve into politics at all. I thought that was a wonderful little reminder that this is a culture that has been oppressed for centuries. Unfortunately, this is a very complex issue and, you know, even the leaders of the different uh, bands or tribes in Canada can't agree on the best way to resolve indigenous problems. As someone who is also German, the historical shame runs deep in my blood and it has made me try my hardest to approach other cultures with openness and acceptance. And I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know in my own writing I try to include people of color and I do a lot of reading and about you know how to do this properly and how to not try to create a story of something that's not my own. I'm sorry I'm talking about this at length but it is something that I find important and I think that we should think about. So anyway, I'll wrap that up now. Um, I'm going to say <laughs> that the plot of Trial of Lightning was engaging and the story moves at a great pace. Actually, the pacing was perfect. Uh, the characters took time to sleep, to eat, and the action scenes were fun without being too long and they never got boring. Roan Horse has this engaging, fun style that's both colloquial and eloquent. Overall, Trail of Lightning will please die-hard post-apocalyptic fans like myself and those who just love a great action story focused on characters of cultures that we don't see enough. So I'm giving it a 5 out of 5 stars. I recommend it to anybody that likes post-apocalyptic action adventure. I, I definitely loved it. I'm definitely going to get the sequel, Storm of Locusts. I have a couple little spoiler parts. So jump to this part here just to skip to my next review if you want to skip the spoilers. Uh, so one thing that I really loved from this novel was the realistic love scene post-trauma. So um, Maggie has a lot of issues. She has a lot of physical and mental blocks when it comes to physical affection, when it comes to any kind of affection. And so I really loved how while her body wanted to get with Kai, she, her mind set up a block and totally took her from it. And he understood that and he was willing to work with her through it. And I loved that. I loved that it wasn't just a jump from, jump into sex, because I don't think that that's realistic for someone that has gone through trauma. I mean, some people do that as a way to block out, like, so it depends, like, it could be for some people, maybe that's how they heal is to, like, approach it, but it didn't feel like that would have worked for Maggie, it would have felt unrealistic, and I really like that approach. That fight scene in the arena was fantastic, that was awesome, like, that was such so I was so good and it ended in a way I didn't expect. I was like, is she gonna die? Like, I actually thought that something, like, I, I was so actually surprised that she supposedly died. The focus on coffee in the novel was so realistic and relatable. Oh, that was coffee. <laughs> and the twist with Coyote. Ah, I was expecting some kind of a backstab given like the, what I know of his character from the studies that I've taken, but it totally caught me by surprise. And I was like, oh, how did I not see this coming? So yeah, I really, I loved it, so yeah. The next book that I read was Salvage Crew by, and I apologize, uh, Yudhan Jaya Wijernatne. I am so sorry. Uh, if it makes you feel any better, no one can pronounce my last name. <laughs> Not very often anyway. So this is a hard sci-fi. I'd say a bit of an adventure sci-fi too. It was published I think in 20... 2017? I'll put the real date up here, I can't remember. Uh, anyway, and I listened to this via audiobook on Audible. I should have loved this. <laughs> it has all the elements I generally love in a, a sci-fi. New planets, first contact, survivalism, alien creatures, regular people doing a regular job but in the far future, I love that concept. It has an interesting premise as well. But I found it really hard to be engaged in this story. I think part of the issue was the narration. I love Nathan Fillion. Like, so hot. But <laughs> he was why I decided, and he was why I decided to listen to this novel, but he mumbles a bit. As such, I couldn't listen to the novel at like 1.5 or 2 times speed, which is my preference. <laughs> and if people talk too slow for my apparently like hyper-wired brain, I, I can't pay as much attention as I should. I find that I zone out or I get distracted. So that's kind of what I think what happened here. Uh, maybe if I was reading the book, I would have liked it more. I don't know though, because I'm not going to go and read the book. <laughs> So Salvage Crew is told from the perspective of a man turned AI. He's been translated into the computer of a salvage operation where he like oversees the work of three humans as they build a base, explore the nearby area, and attempt to find the salvage they were sent there to find. What they didn't expect were hostiles in the form of alien animals and this rival salvage crew. 
So I can't blame all the issues that I had with the novel on the narration. Uh, the author is clearly a smart guy. He draws from hi he draws from history, literature, other sci-fi works, and some pop culture and real science to world, world build. But sometimes it comes on too strong and becomes almost pedantic. Perhaps it was simply how Nathan Fillion narrated it, though, because he can definitely, I mean, if you've seen Firefly, he can definitely be arrogant. <laughs> like, he can put in an arrogant character. So perhaps it was coming, that was coming through a bit. There were also some poetry and some quotations that were somewhat annoying to listen to. I will admit, you know, while I like poetry, if a poem is included in narration, I tend to skip it. I don't know why. I just like, I'm like, no, I don't have time for this. I also wasn't entirely convinced that the Charge of the Light Brigade, which he references also often, really applied to this story. I've always been a fan of that poem, because I'm a dork, uh, but I read it as Tennyson honoring the soldier's sacrifice and how they charge towards certain death without fear. That's why it's called Charge of the Night Light Brigade, not Fall of the Light Brigade. Uh, comparing the Charge of the Light Brigade soldiers to three useless salvagers doing a job for a company fell kind of short for me in terms of a working illusion. Cameron Hurley's double twist on the poem in the Light Brigade book, uh, that resonated more clearly with me. That one made more sense because they're actually soldiers. So I don't know, that that kind of annoyed me. It's like a minor thing, but I, it just bothered me. <laughs> um, the characters, I really loved how the overseer though could see and hear everything going on due to his drones and his little spider bots and things like that. That part was really believable and that part was exceptionally well done. I thought that was really cool. I was wondering, I was like, how are we gonna have a full-fledged story just through the eyes of an, the eyes of an IA that stuck, AI that's stuck in a ship, like stuck in a base? But it, it was really well done. Uh, except despite being in first person, I didn't feel like I knew him that well. We only learn kind of small tidbits about his life previous to becoming, you know, a machine, but he never talks too much about the things he misses from being human, you know, physical contact, he never ruminates on that. He's got a full range of emotions though, like, like, pain, but can he feel love? Like, given all the focus on the AI stuff, this question, not love specifically, but his transfer from human to AI, it, it left me wondering the whole time about what he was, what emotions he was capable of and, and like how does he feel these emotions without the nerve endings associated with them, like that kind of thing. The other characters also fell woefully flat. It's really frustrating because the plot itself is enjoyable and engaging, so why not have six characters instead of just three? I mean, many hands make light work. <laughs> and give them more background. But all we get is like a cursory info dump at the start of each character, which I found hindered rather than helped to make me interested in them. Rather than tell us about Simon's experiences in the sim world right off the bat, why not have him, you know, be this geeky geologist until he goes crazy with the rifle and then it's like a big surprise or a mystery as to why he's good with it, you know? Uh, same with Anna. The overseer doubts her from the start, but other than a few sentences near the end, it doesn't contribute much to her story, you know, and Milo gets no development at all. I was like, how am I even reading this book where there's like four characters and I don't know anything about the three of them? <laughs> there's also no like snarky banter, most arguments are told in passing, and the characters don't grow or develop. I, I didn't feel like I knew any of them, which made it really hard to care about their story. <laughs> And the ending just went on and on and on. As someone who knows a lot about this kind of concept and and whom AI literature isn't really my favorite kind of sci-fi, I found it a bit didactic and I kept checking out how much time was left on my phone. <laughs> now this did contribute to my rating, but of the four characters, we only get one woman character. If we lived in a world where gender parity wasn't an issue, I wouldn't care. But Anna's sole representation as the only woman and the fact that she wasn't involved in 90% of the gunfights bothered me a bit. I don't think it was intentional. I don't think, I think it was great that he did include a female character. I just, you know, I, I was like, why can't they just have more characters and have a couple more women? You know, this pet, this does not pack the, pass the Bechtel test, of course. I mean, the other ship is a female, but I'm like, why are we giving ships gender? I don't know. So the novel felt to me like a well put together cake. It has all the elements a cake should have, but the flavor is lacking and the icing is way too thin. <laughs> I didn't dislike it, but I think the, and I think the author is really talented at world building and con complex concepts, but there was like no story within the plot to make me excited. As such, I give it a three out of five and I recommend it to people who like hard sci-fi with a focus on AI. 
And the last book that I read <laughs> this month was Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Um, so I reserved both of these for my library thinking they wouldn't come in at the same time and they both came in at the exact same time. So I just read them both. Uh, you can check out my review. I've listed it as well below. I just posted it, I think, on the other day. So uh, yeah, I really liked that one too. I also read Evil Under the Sun by Agatha Christie, but I've talked it out for one review, so I'll talk about that next time. Uh, yeah, so thank you for watching. Let me know if you've read any of these. Let me know if you've listened to or read The Salvage Crew, and if you disagree with me, that that's cool. Anyway, thanks for watching, and uh, 